Honestly, I'm, I'm all sides. I, uh, my day job is I'm a, a professor at the uh, University of San Francisco. Cornelia Van Cott is one of my colleagues there. And uh, um, I've been working there for, uh, I've, I've been as, I think my 20th year was starting in August. And before that, I was a, a high school teacher. Um, I worked in Colorado Springs and also in San Francisco. I worked at the urban school. Uh, right out of college, and then a, a boarding school in Colorado Springs, and uh, and I've been involved with math contests and math circles for um, for a really long time. Um, so problem. So so I first um, actually learned the definition of a problem in of, of what I, I had never really thought about it in a coherent way until 1990. Uh, when I had a, a job helping to train the International Math Olympiad team, uh, and so I had better understand it then. And uh, the, uh, um, one of the other trainers uh, was a Romanian fellow who um, explained, uh, uh, explained to me the difference between a problem and an exercise. And so an exercise is something that you know how to you know how to get the answer to immediately. You know, like everybody who's not, a, everybody who's past, uh, you know, fourth grade, this is an exercise, right? You know what to do. And likewise, if you're just a grade or two beyond that, then this is also an exercise. Even though you'll probably make, get it wrong, it's still an the, Getting it right or wrong does not make it not be an exercise. <laughs> It, it be, it, it's hard and you'll get it wrong, it's still an exercise, okay? Uh, a problem, by definition, is something, is a math question that's not an exercise. And what's a problem will depend on your experience and uh, you know, how, how much you, you, you study. But, uh, um, but, uh, but, but by their very nature, problems are not the things that are at the end of the chapter. Where you just uh, where you, where it uses the material that you read about during that chapter. A problem. Oh, so uh, what a, a problem requires is investigation, and investigation requires time. Problems also require getting them wrong. Usually, usually problems end in failure, uh, and failure is something is, is is not something bad. Failure, failure is, is part of the uh, is, is part of the process. I wrote a book about problem solving in uh, 1999, and my, I chose as my epigraph one of my favorite quotes about uh, about uh, problem solving, which I got from a um, a book of travel essays by Tim Cahill called Jaguars Ripped My Flesh. Any of you read Tim Cahill? He used to write for Outside Magazine, and the quote was. Um, and this sums it up, and that, I'm going to pretty much shut up about this, the non-mathematical stuff, but this quote sums up the whole, the whole thing, which is, the explorer is the person, or is a person, I don't remember, it's a, uh, or the, who is lost. Okay, so, so that's what we're going to be doing, is exploring. I'll try to give you some ideas about how to be how to improve your investigation skills, um, and at, at, along the way. And but what I want you to, what I want us to do is to start with really a warm-up problem. This is something that I've done in the San Francisco Math Circle, with, and I got this idea from a book, uh, a Russian book, about a math circle for uh, um, for preschoolers. Uh, and there's really good good problems that that you know. So if it's five. Five and six year olds and four year olds can do it, then, then we can do it. So by the way, do you, do you all know what we mean when I say math circle? Probably not, right? So, um, math circle is an Eastern European, um, uh, it's a borrowing from Eastern Europe. It comes from the uh, uh, Russian um, phrase that in Russia they actually call these things, uh, uh, um, uh, it's called a mathematischki uh, kruzhok. Kruzhok means little circle in Russian, and uh, so it literally means a little math circle. And what it is is it's it's a math club like any after school thing, but the emphasis uh, is, 
two things make it different from maybe a standard American style math club. It's usually not just a teacher with kids, it's usually a bunch of mathematical grown-ups with kids. So if it's middle school kids, you could have college students helping them, high school students helping them, graduate students like, like Kyle helping them, uh, mathematicians at universities helping them, um, and world-renowned mathematical researchers helping them as well. You could have this whole sort of vertical column of different levels of expertise all in the same room. And then the other focus is the curriculum is not acceleration or you know, doing more homework. The curriculum is, is almost exclusively problem solving. And so kids work on problems, often struggle with problems. They have uh, maybe world famous mathematicians helping them a little bit, but mostly they're just working on problems. And that's the idea of a math circle. And that's what we'll be doing here, except that we're not world famous. Um, I don't think you introduced yourself. You came in at the, the, the last minute, so if you okay. could say the, what we were doing is everyone had to say their name and where, where they what they teach and their favorite math fact. Yeah, yeah, if you have one. Well, a lot of people, a lot of people have on that. Okay, well, I'm Sherry Kinky. Good morning. Good morning. Got a little Sorry. Um, I'm uh, in the process of getting my credential to teach math um, middle high school and I uh, have a, my background I'm an artist so I'm kind of a weird math person I have a, a weird left right brain thing going on I don't know it's just something I've given math is always easy for me I think I like it because of that and I like the, the linear, linear process but I also am very creative so my class will be like no other math class because it will be from the creative perspective and I have three degrees in theater, and I also am an artist. And do you have a favorite math fact? I don't. I mean, I, I don't. I, I have to think about that. Uh -huh. A fact. I mean, is that a sort of problem? It's what Brandy asked us to do. Uh, no. <laughs> I like math. I really like it. It's, it's uh, um, I like problem solving, and I think it's really a, a, a great skill. I think it's underrated. In term, and the fear factor, of course, but I think it's a great skill uh, in problem solving in life. I think having that ability to go step by step is really, um, it's, an, it's, a, it's an asset. So I never mentioned my favorite math fact, and I don't really have a favorite, I mean, because it's kind of hard to, to, to order them, but I have like a, like a sort of a new crush um, and um, which is how, and um, I just recently learned something about the number eight that made it interesting for me. And, I'm, and I might talk about it later, because um, I think I might be filling in for Brandon in the afternoon. And if, if so, I'll, I'll, I'll share my number eight thing. So um, I want you to work on problem one, which is, uh, uh, and so let me ex explain it. It's, it's, a, it's a game, so you're going to need to break into groups of three. One person will be a dealer, and then the other two will be the opponents, and the dealer will keep score. The way it works is, in, uh, I'll give you a bunch of, of cards, and the cards um, have, uh, there's three types of cards. One has a one on it, and a two on the other side. The other one has a two on one side, and a three on the other side. And the other one has a three and a four. So three flavors of cards. Sometimes the writing is on lined, is on the lined part. Sometimes it's black, sometimes it's red, it doesn't matter. I, I made these cards with my children last, last night. Um, and the way it works is the dealer will, two people will be sitting opposite one another. So pretend you two are sitting opposite. And then the dealer will hold up a card so that you, that you can only see one side of it. And then your job is to guess as quickly as possible your opponent's, what your opponent is seeing. Get it? And it's a contest. What's and on the other side? Can you get more than oh, okay. um, um, You can, the dealer can, can devise rules for how that will work. But, but ideally, um, the, 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 you could say the first person to get it right gets a point, or a wrong, wrong guess could lose a point. The dealer can decide. Be informal about it, but what I want you to do is play this, break, get into groups of three, and play this game for about five, six minutes, and then we'll discuss it, okay? That's all I want you to do. I'm not, I'm not giving you a problem necessarily to solve here, but I want you to play the game and think about it. Okay. But we need three people because we need a dealer and we need two players. Do we have a multiple of three of people here? Um, we don't exactly. Okay, well. Um, um, 
We do if you're in it, Paul. Well, I can, de I can do some dealing. You can be so, a dealer. Um, let's see. So, there's some cards. Okay, and uh, here's some cards. I'll give you more cards. I'll just make sure there's enough. Here's some cards. I can be the dealer for you in a minute. I'm going to give up some more cards. There's more cards. More cards. More cards. There's some more cards. Two can be paired in two different Yeah. Uh, exactly. So 
Sometimes, um, but um, now what I noticed with when uh, you're Dan, yeah. Dan and, and Lisa, were, are you Lise? Lise. Lise, Dan and Lise were playing. 
Lisa, whenever she had a two, she always pretty much quickly guessed three, right? That, that was her strategy, even though she knew she could be wrong. Um, now, and uh, after a while, and that worked for a while because just just by the, the, the luck of the draw, there, there were a lot of two, three cards in, in that pile. But then I think Dan started getting wise to that strategy, and he was, uh, and, and it, as soon as she was wrong, he could quickly nail her. And so, so it's sort of like rock, paper, scissors. You sometimes have to vary a strategy. An interesting problem would be what is the optimal strategy for playing this game, assuming the person you're playing with has the same CPU speed and, and uh, as you do. I, I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's just an interesting warm-up problem just to get you thinking about, about um, uh, information and, and communication. Um, so I want you to, uh, um, to now, uh, you can stay in your groups of three or think about this alone. I want you to do uh, problem two. Um, uh, I want you to think about problem two and problem three. Um, and these are both I, um, problems with the same same kind of theme. Problem two, I think, is easier than problem three, but they both have the same idea. Problem two, I got it from a an eleven year old girl uh, who is uh, uh, friends of my family. I don't know where the origin of it is, but it's, uh, it's and problem three is uh, <coughs> is just an old folklore problem. And again, I don't know its, its origin. But look at problems two and three now. Just if you want to, if, if if you want to work alone, that's fine, but if you would rather confer with other people, that's also good. So take a few minutes to look at both of those, both of those problems. And if you have any questions about it, let me know. Good. So, so look around that room, and, and and these are all people that are just as dumb as you are. <laughs> so you shouldn't feel dumb because there's no one in this room that's dumb. Okay. So, um, and you should get used to feeling dumb, but you should get used to not feeling bad about feeling dumb. Let me put it that way. Okay. Um, so there's uh, um, um, at least three people here who have PhDs in math. I guess, um, anybody else besides the, the three of us? So, um, what percent of the time do you, do you feel like you don't understand the math that you're trying to think about? Oh, 99. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and that's uh, important. But on the other hand, you, but you like it that way. I mean, yeah. you might prefer it, it to be 98, <laughs> but you, you'll settle for 99% lack of understanding because it's fun just thinking about the math that you don't understand yet. So, so and, and, I'm not, and those numbers aren't exaggerations. I mean, the, the uh, a person that does math for a living spends almost all of their waking hours unsuccessfully attacking problems. Um, but ideally, that, they, that, that is a mostly pleasurable state. And that's the, so the, the, the point is that 
what we're doing is, more, is at, at least as much psychology as it is anything else. And it's, it, it's um, you know, we're in Berkeley. This is, you can think of this as a self-help workshop rather than a math workshop. So self-actualization. Well, yeah, but that's, that's what I would love to teach my students is how to view not knowing the answer as yeah. a good state. Right, and that's... Because they've been, they've been taught since time immemorial that if they don't know the answer, then they're not... Right. Not well, all, not only that, but if you don't know the answer within 45 seconds, you're not smart. Exactly. Right. And so there's there's not a single question here that um, that should be answerable in 45 seconds unless you've seen it already. In which case, it's an ex it's it's an exercise. An exercise not, um, but anyway, so um, if you if you're confused about problem two, that's okay. But you might want to don't just bang your head on it, look at problem three as well. Look at both, think about both of them simultaneously. I'm not saying that they're exactly the same problem, but they, they might just, they might inspire you. <clears throat> and don't feel, uh, um, don't feel shy about talking to your neighbor either, because uh, talk about the, these two problems, I want to um, take, take a few minutes to lecture a tiny bit about um, problem solving biology. So um, as I said earlier, the, the key to problems is investigation. And so if you think about what is problem solving biology, it has to be the science of facilitating investigation. That's all it is. So it's not just a math subject, but a psychology subject. And we mentioned this psychology idea about just getting used to uh, the fact that problems are hard and that you don't always solve them. You certainly don't always solve them instantaneously. And you have to learn to not feel, you have to learn to either not feel stupid or not feel bad about feeling stupid. Um, and, and you have to be disciplined about it. You really do because then, you know, your nature is, is usually to feel bad if you fail. And here you want, you don't want to feel bad if you fail because failing is, failing is not only part of the process, but it's an essential part of the process. Um, but that's it's not enough. We, so, so here is um, a, uh, uh, this is my, uh, my uh, working model for how, how I, I like to think about the uh, 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 investigating problems. I, I divide the investigation into sort of three, three uh, um, levels. There's the strategy level. And then there's the tactics level, and then there's the the the, uh, the finest, uh, the, the the narrowest focus, which I call the uh, tools. Um, so if you're uh, if you're a, a math teacher, an example of a tool would be say um, if you're a, an algebra teacher, say completing the square. Of, of a tool, say, and uh, um, and if you're an, an elementary school uh, teacher, uh, a tool might be a, a, a much a, a more prosaic thing, say, uh, just uh, um, a uh, um, something <coughs> like uh, uh, checking uh, checking your answer might even be a tool, or um, uh, or uh, inverting a fraction to when you divide, things like that. These are, these are very specific techniques. The pro most people think that to, to become better at solving problems, you want to amass more and more tools. And it's good to have more and more tools, but it's sort of like going to a hardware store and buying all the different kinds of you know, drill bits you can buy. You can, whereas you can do a lot with just you know, a, a couple of tools and you know, duct tape or something like that. And so, uh, if you work at these, these uh, uh, 
higher levels here, um, it's, it's more productive, especially uh, for a beginner. And, uh, um, and, one, and so I, what I'm going to uh, start doing is listing over here some common strategies that you can start to think about specifically when you're solving problems. And so one of the things is, so like with problem two, the one with the people buried in the sand, um, there's a, um, the, the one, and also with problem three, the light bulb problem. First, first of all, are there any questions about either of those problems? You've read them both? So let's talk about the light bulb problem. What's, the, what's hard about it? So th this, is, this, is, this is a question that will lead to a, a strategy. What, what's the difficulty with the light bulb problem? Yeah. Well, it's, if you turn one on and yeah. you go upstairs and it's still not on, I mean, yeah, still not on, uh -huh. you still haven't figured out which one's going to turn it on. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa, if you turn two on and you went upstairs and it was on, you mm -hmm. don't know what which one turned it on. So it's going to take more, in that situation, it would take more than one trip to go upstairs. Right, so so, so the, the difficulty with that problem, if I can, you're Susan, right? Yes. Yeah, so what Susan is saying is, is it seems as though there's not enough information in some sense. Like the, 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 and, and here's, a, here's a way to, uh, um, uh, to paraphrase it, which is the problem is that you have only, uh, um, there's how many switches? There's three switches, but the light bulb, so the, the, the switches, there's three kinds of switches, but the light bulb has only two states, right? That's the difficulty. That's the crux of the problem. Uh, uh, if you were working at on, on uh, problems in less uh, in more formal math, like say an algebra problem, it could be that the fundamental difficulty of the problem is that it involves fractions, and fractions are bad, or that it involves square roots, and square roots are bad. These are so. So one of the first things to do is to is to locate your uh, is to locate the difficulty, and uh, and uh, isolate that difficulty, and so. So here's a here's a psychological strategy that's helpful for for dealing with difficulties, and it's just it's just a dumb strategy, but I find it it's very helpful. I call it wishful thinking. <laughs> thinking. So. Is this a strategy? It's a strategy. Yeah, it's basically it's it's one almost all strategies involve the fundamental problem that we're human beings and thus tend to be stupid most of the time. And these are strategies for dealing with our stupidity and making us be more productive even though we're stupid. And to think about and to so to give us confidence and to, to help us to deal with our, our with the, um, our frustrations and, and uh, uh, impediments we have. And so the thing so so what what you should do is invent a problem you can solve that's similar to the problem that you have. And so for example wouldn't it be great if you had two switches? That would be too easy, though. Okay. So, given that you're stuck with three switches, then what would be nice about the light bulb? Yeah. Like, would wouldn't it be nice if the light bulb, like, you know, had three colors or something like that, or something like that? Wouldn't that be great? Okay. In other words, what we what we're trying to do is add an extra bit of information. Uh huh. So. Uh, and now think about light bulbs. Actually, think about you know visuals. Don't just think about them, but but, but do an out of body experience. Actually, you know, get you know, pretend that you're in a room with a light bulb. And you know, what do you want to do with the light bulb? Well, maybe it's not you. But um, do light bulbs have more than two states? Yes. Yeah. What, so what are what are the two what are the, what's the third state? Or what what tell me some state? What tell me about light? It could bulbs. be a light bulb that um, has two um, levels of light. You could it could be you could be lucky and it could be one of those those uh, light bulbs like that. But this is just one of those hundred watt bulbs, a you know, old fashioned. Hot. hot. You get it? Hot. 
So in other words, there's, there's three, a bulb, the, the bulb doesn't have two states. It actually has three states. It can be on, and it can be off cold, off warm. All right, now you might feel bad because I've sort of given you a big hint and helped you to solve the problem. Don't feel that bad because there's tons of problems that, that you won't get hints about. And that, that you can, but the, but, but the, what we want to do is deconstruct the, the, the thinking involved in this is, is, the, the dip, is use the diff, it's sort of like a judo thing. Use the difficulty of the problem to come up with a strategy for investigating it. The, the, because what happens with a problem like this is you say three switches, two states, impossible. Three switches, two states, impossible. You get this cycle. It can't be done. It can't be done. I can prove to you it can't be done. Why can't it? But then you have to ask yourself, why can't it be done? It can't be done because a bulb only has two states. And so then just ask yourself, well, what if a bulb didn't have two states? Then the problem could be solved. And then it turns out, well, actually, the bulb does have three states. Right? So, so the way you solve this problem is you turn one switch on, you leave one switch alone, and then the third switch you turn it on, leave it on for a minute, then you turn it off, then you run upstairs, and then you'll know which switch actually controls the bulb. Isn't that cool? So uh, one of my best friends is a very, uh, very accomplished mathematician and was uh, one of the winners of the Putnam exam, which is the undergraduate problem solving competition, so he's incredibly good at problem solving. He couldn't do this problem. Are there bulbs that don't give off heat? Fluorescent? Even they, they give off, you, they, they're warm, you know, you it's run up the stairs. Lighting. Yeah, the, yeah. But, but I said it's a standard 100 watt bulb. Yeah. 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 But even, a, even, a, even one of the green fluorescent bulbs, they, they, they will have some, some warmth to them, yeah, definitely. Uh, they, they don't hurt your hand, but you right. will feel warm. And again, this is so. But the thing is, this is a really good puzzle to torture your friends with. But the, the it's not just for me to torture you, or for you to torture others. It's for you to learn the, 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 the principle. What the principle in here that there's an important problem solving mm -hmm. idea which you can use in future problems. Okay. Would you say the answer? Again? Well, so you tell me. So. So I what? Said turn one on. Mm -hmm. on. Right, so because you, what you want to do is you, you're going to do stuff, so you're going to do three different things with the switches and then go upstairs to see which of the three different things happen with the light bulb. So either the light bulb is going to be on uh, or the light bulb is going to be off and cold or the light bulb is going to be off and, uh, and warm. And so you turn one switch on leave it, and leave it on. And you turn one switch, you just leave it in the off position. And the third switch, you turn it on for a while and then turn it off. Then you run upstairs. And when you get, get upstairs, the light bulb, if the light bulb is shining bright, then it has to be switch one. If the light bulb is cold and off, then, then, it, then switch two had to have been the one that would have turned it on. So then if the light bulb is off, but it still feels a little warm, then you know it was that third switch. It's a fantastic, fantastic problem. Notice there's no math in there, or is there math? What's, what, what's the only mathematics involved here? Three minus three yeah. equals zero. You know? <laughs> well, three. If then statements, they need to learn if then statements. Right, yeah, yeah. So three is greater than two, but actually three is equal to three. That's the that's the math that we're using here. Um, so uh, so go back and look at problem two. And because uh, um, problem two, remember an eleven year old girl told it to me. And I don't I asked her to solve it and I, and she said, I don't remember the solution. But then after a while she she remembered it. But, but uh, um, I don't want to shame you and say an 11 year old kid could do it, but it doesn't, there's no hard math in there.
Somebody else is calling. Um, I believe it's going to be put online once it gets edited. So, uh, people can look at the watch the lecture if you weren't here for the conference. I don't know how well it's online and available to talk about the Sometimes it's I believe, I'm not sure, I can find out. Or you well, can ask Randy. So you work at the same school? Uh, Please do. Uh, <laughs> so which school was it? Uh, we, we both work mm -hmm. in Alameda. Uh, and you know Maya. Yeah. She's a year, I think. Not From sure. here. No, I think mm -hmm. so. She, she did this in the mm -hmm. last summer. Oh, so, um, okay, so I probably do. So we work in this. So last week, we all, all three of us at one point or another worked at Island High School. Mm -hmm. It's a university school mm -hmm. in Alameda. But then I also teach um, pre calculus and, and other two at the regular high school. Oh, yeah. I was at Alameda. For a long time, and this year I was at Alameda. And the next year I'll be at Alameda. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
in my Greek Orthodox class. We did this yeah, whole series of, of things of building the understanding for um, you know, the summation of a of, 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 mm -hmm. of arithmetic series. And at the end of this, I thought relatively well this thing. I said, so what, what would be the general rule? How would you go about doing this? I'm playing with a lot. Yeah. But I'm using help with it. Oh, well. Did we just spent three days building, yeah. you know, building stair steps. <laughs> Failure is, is part of the game, right? Exactly. So I just realized, so you didn't introduce yourself, but right, and that's a, a, another person who, because you, you came towards the end, I don't think yeah. people, so. Yeah. Um, I teach at Contra Costa College, I've been teaching for about 20 years, and I've wanted to be able to better lead math circles, and although I came to this before, I wanted to just watch Paul, because for me, problem solving in math, I think I'm learning, but problem solving, how do you switch gears from being a lecturer to being a a math circle guide, I have not gotten over that hump. And so I wanted to just watch Paul today and try to figure out how do you lead a math circle. But I have yet to crack that nut. So I'm also writing a book, um, Playing with Math. I'm editing other people's writing. Playing with Math, uh, Stories from Math Circles, Homeschoolers, and the Internet. So According to the schedule, there's supposed to be something happening at 10.30 and it's 10.45, so it could be that the that Josh's group might come back in here and there'll be some t-shirts or something, but until they do, let's, let's get back to problem two with the, the heads in the sand, pink bodies in the sand. So, um, uh, I know a couple people at least have solved it, right? Um, and how about, who has, so, so who hasn't solved it? Be proud to admit to not solving it. Okay. So, um, uh, so keep your hands higher. So I, I want to call on some. Okay. So um, so you are Vanessa. All right. So so um, so you you haven't solved it, but you've tried stuff. Tell me what you've tried. No, don't what? Don't put me on the spot. Oh, okay. So, so um, I'll get you later. Okay. okay? <laughs> um, but 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 I I I I really want to to um, have people who. Um, who haven't solved the problem to talk about because again I want to stress that it's the the lack of solving uh, is not the lack of solving is not without value it, and, and and we can try to mine mine what what doesn't work to try to find something that does work. So now what is what is your name? Corinne? Corinne. Corinne? Corinne? Corinne. 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 Okay so Corinne what have you tried that has not worked? I drew black circles and white circles and mm -hmm. I um, I sort of decided that it's up to guy number four because mm -hmm. he's got the most information in front of him. He certainly does, or she. Or she. They look like they look like males, don't they? But that's just my artwork because they have <laughs> baseball caps. Um, so, so person number four has the most information or can see the most number of caps, right? Yeah. So in two of the six scenarios, he has the answer already. Mm -hmm. But in the other four. If you see two different colors in front of him, he's not sure yet. As in the picture illustrated, yes. right? Yeah. And so, so, uh, and so that, so the difficulty for you is that you're focusing on person four, and you're because person four, in some sense, should be able to be the guesser, but then you realize that sometimes person four can't guess. True. Okay. Good. Okay. Do you, does everybody under, understand Corinne's observation? That person four, we'd like person four to be our go-to guy, but he's he, he's going to fail some of the like so for so so visualize it, and this is this is an important thing is is to remember math is not an abstract subject; it's a physical subject in, in the physical world, especially if you're a teacher. Uh, and the the, the further uh, uh, towards kindergarten you go, the more physical it is, which is. However, it should stay physical, even, even in grad school. And one problem with grad school is math tends to get too abstract. Um, but you should always per, you know, try to visualize that you're stuck in the sand there. You know? And so you're person number four. So when would you be happy if you're person number four? Tell me exactly when you'd be happy. 
You see two black hats or two white hats. Right, because if you see two black hats, you know you got white, and if you see two white hats, you know you got black, because you're told that there's exactly two black and two white. How about person one? Is person one going to do anything? Person one is hopeless, right? How about person two? Person two is just like person one, right? First, they, they, they're, they, they are, they, and so at least they know to shut up, right? Because if they open their mouth, then everybody dies because, because the, even if they guess their, the correct hat, the evil villain would say, explain your reasoning, say, oh, I just was guessing, and say, well, your punishment for guessing is we're all, you're all going to die. So, so you know that one and two shut up, and you know that, and four seems to be, be failing you. So, Corinne, you're on the spot. So, so your your look at guy four uh, didn't seem to work. So, what oh, are you forced I to think about? It. Oh, if four isn't talking, then that means you have a different color than the one in front of you. If you're three, so that's how you answer. Okay. So, so the so so the the idea is you. Um, So if four if four is able to guess, then she will guess, right? If four is just standing there and you're not, you know, five minutes have elapsed, then person two and person one say, "Damn it! I hope somebody can save us." And person three says, "Person three is thinking to herself, what does person three see? A hat, right? Or well, maybe a hat, say, right? Maybe it's not white, but sees a hat, right?" And so let's say, without loss of generality, let's say that person three sees a white hat. So she's saying, man, I either have a white or a black hat. Right? That's it. So let's, let's think about it. What if she has a white hat? She's saying, suppose I had a white hat. Then what would have happened if I had a white hat? And this idiot sitting behind me would, would, have, would have saved us. But she hasn't. So... If this is silent, it means that this person has to have the hat that keep, lets this person be silent. If this person speaks up, then they're safe. Okay? All right? So I helped you to solve the problem just by asking you why you weren't solving the problem. The trick is to ask yourself that question, but even better is don't work alone. Work with a partner. And then you and say to your partner, well, this is what I've been thinking. And then your partner might come up with and so, but so, what's the mathematical moral behind this story? What 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 was the uh, what was what uh, the what was the sort of the crux idea? Don't ignore information. Don't ignore I don't know parts of the problem. Mm -hmm. And don't look for just the obvious. So so uh, we could call it, it's it's like a famous Sherlock Holmes quote, right? You know that one. It's if it, it is once you have it's examined really all of right if you've exclude if you've eliminated the um, impossible or or so remains however improbable is the same time. right so um, and and so so if you um, I'm not going to write that down I'm not sure how to um, well let's but but let's but let's use this fact that that uh, negative information is information. Okay, the fact that person number four couldn't solve, couldn't always solve it. What happened when Corinne first did it was she looked at number four, said number four should be able to solve it. Then she was able to prove number four couldn't always solve it. And then she was stymied because she felt that her best shot failed. Um, and so the thing to do is to take another shot and say, okay, well, let's use the fact that four failed. And, and can we use... Can we use that failure somehow? Okay. Yes, Sue. I loved Paul's book because he did the problem-solving process differently than, uh, oh, God, I'm spacing out his name, um, the one everybody copies. Polia. Polia, who said there's four steps, and the last step is look back. And I, I got it, but I totally agreed with Corinne when I was thinking about it. Four has more information. How can this possibly make sense that four has more information and three is the one that answers. So I was looking back going, it still doesn't make sense to me even though I got an answer. Um, and, but, and so the thing, the thing to uh, realize is four, four sees more hats than three does. But three re 
receives information from four. Four doesn't receive information from anybody. Four is able to transmit either certitude or uncertitude. And so, so four, so three has the hack that she can see plus the knowledge of four's state of mind. So three actually has more information than four in some sense. I was thinking of it more as three's yeah. hat is somehow a piece of the information. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but, and, and it's, you know, we can, we can deconstruct these things in, in fun, fun ways and uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's, and one thing that, that that's in, is, is important is to realize that it, you can spend years going back to the same problem and looking at it again and again and again. I was just uh, um, reading a, a really cool word problem, which maybe I'll share with you later, um, where um, there's this, uh, where there's many ways of solving the problem, but then there's this one fantastic way that makes it so easy to understand, and, and you might not ever ever encounter it unless you you know, so you could come back with, back to the problem again and again and again. But what I want to do now is let's look at problem four, which is more hats, and this is a, in my opinion a significantly uh, more challenging problem. But let's act it out just for fun. So let's get say six people to line up, and uh, and the rest of you can be. Can just watch, and we can just sort of look at the process. So, just any old, any six people, just um, line up, uh, you know, this way. Uh, I have a hat, so I should be able to. right. But I'm not going to use hats because the thing about using hats is, is uh, as you know, as teachers, is the, there's the lice problem, so we never, we don't ever want to share hats. So I'm going to use, I'm going to use uh, sticky tape. So, uh, um, so, so, yeah, come, come, come a little closer. Yeah. So, so, um, so, uh, so the, so, and there's six of you, right? And so, so, um, so what we're, uh, the, what we're doing is. Uh, so Corinne is in front, so she can see. No, so you, so she sees nobody's hat, okay. And and, uh, and then uh, so we, we have um, Shirley can see one hat, okay. Lise can see two hats, and so on. Everybody can see uh, all the hats in front of them, but not the, the hat that, that they have. And uh, um, and so um, I'll simulate this. For, and by just putting, uh, I'll be putting a hat like on your back like that, and uh, uh, I'm going to be using uh, uh, the colors green and blue. Uh, so let's say green we'll call white and blue we'll call black. Okay. All right. And uh, um, and I can see. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. And so if you want to stand, you know, off off offset so that you can uh, so that you can see. Um, um, that you can see um, what other people are wearing. Okay. And we know there's equal amounts of the different colored post-its. No. Oh, you know nothing know. about the distribution of the post-its. So unlike problem two, where there was two and two, in this one, it could be that everybody has green. It could be that everybody has blue. In fact, let's just use green and blue since that's the yes. actual colors. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, um, and so, um, the and what we'll, we'll do is we're going to start with Jennifer. She will guess or deduce her hat color, and then we'll move up all the way up to the front to Corinne, to Corinne, and uh, and people have to guess their their hats. Okay. Now, um, in before this ordeal begins, you are allowed to, to strategize. So I'm 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 pretending you've already strategized. I just want the group to just see what's happening here. And so, so let's think about. So and the idea is the most the, the largest number of people have to survive. And again, if you guess wrong, you you die. Um, it's important for these problems to be to involve life and death and violence. It makes them, it makes them more. Um, uh, there's a bigger incentive to solve. But again, if you're dealing with sensitive audiences, it should be, you get an ice cream color or you don't. Know. But, but, uh, um, but it has to be, uh, it has to be known. So, so if you get it wrong, then, then, uh, uh, then, then somebody will say wrong or they'll shoot you or something that, that everybody else can hear, okay? So, so you, clearly Jennifer has a problem, right? What's the probability she's gonna guess right? 
can only do 50. There's no way she can do better than that. So, so Jennifer is, is the person in the back is always going to be a 50-50 uh, chance of a loss. Um, the question, though, is how well can we design a strategy so that uh, we can assure more people to survive? That's the question. Okay, and uh, so uh, so so uh, Jennifer is the first person to speak, and Jennifer sees all the hats in front of her, and she'll say something. Okay, and then Sherry will go, and she'll see all the hats in front of her, and she'll say something, and so on. And somehow, we, you want to be able to communicate enough so that as many people can survive as possible. Um, and so, um, you can take the hats off your back now, because this is just to, to get you started. But I want you to see if you can think of a, of a way to Im improve, improve this. But there's no, there's no distribution. Yeah, you know nothing about how the hats were distributed. I think I, I did mostly blue uh, uh, this time. Okay. I did half and half. Oh, I did. That was, but I, but I, but that was accidental. That. Yeah, it was completely accidental, and I, and I, it could be that everybody could get the same color, certainly, or all but one. Yeah, any old way. Okay. And so, uh, so Dan, you have a hat on. So. Ah, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, see if you can think about this and. Uh, um, and so, again, the, the theme here is you're trying to encode something, and you want to communicate something. Um, it's the same model we have to say we have green or blue. Right, you, so, so when it's your turn, you, you're you only allowed to say the word green or the word blue. And that pertains to our hat. That's, right, and you're talking about your hat, yeah. You say green or blue, and, uh, um, and that's, what you're, that's what you're doing. By the way, I'm not going to uh, give you a hint for this problem. Uh, we're gonna, I want you to think about it, and, and, uh, but we're going to move on to looking at some other problems afterwards uh, because those problems will collectively maybe help you to think about, about uh, uh, this problem. But I want you to think about this now. And don't think, work alone. Work, you know, talk with your, your, uh, the people you're sitting with. Can I ask you one Yeah, of course. You were talking about the person on the end, that Jennifer? Uh, the first person to go, yeah, who has who sees the most hats. Yeah. But but but. And you reason that they're 50-50 chance. Yeah, because after all, they they have no information. Nobody has any information about their hat, right? The the, the person in the back has, does knows nothing about his or her hat, and nobody else does either. And so we can be quite confident that the first first person to speak when they say what their hat color is, they have only a 50% chance of getting their hat over. Even though they can see the five hats in front of them, that information does not help them. Mm -hmm. That does not help them, but they might be able to help others. So they may be trying to, we said a strategy. Right. So yeah. we could say, okay, if I'm the back of the line, I'm going to signal to you, yeah. for example. Right. For example, here, so here's a, here's a simple strategy. You can't communicate. You can strategize at first and, and have a long conversation, but once you're once the game begins, you can only say green or blue. So but you here's can talk before. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so yes, yes. And so you want to come up with a strategy that works. But for example, one simple strategy is the altruistic strategy, where you just sacrifice yourself for the person in front of you, or something like that. You could think about that, and uh, and so. Uh, Think about something like that and see what how good that is and see if you can do better than that maybe. But think about that. That's a, that's just a starting point. Okay. I'm going to shut up now.
Everybody, you can guarantee the survival. Yeah. 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 Yeah.